Doc, if you're going through town, I better send a couple men with you. If anyone wants to take a shot at me, a couple of men more or less won't stop them. Open the gate. involved, are we? Enough to get hurt. 10,000 shares. Well, then why don't we sell out? Because since the strike, we wouldn't be able to get anywhere near their market value. If the governor had any guts, he'd move the troops in up there. Now, wait a minute. They're destroying private property. Troops aren't the answer. Well, what is the answer? Nick, why don't you ride up there as soon as possible and find out what it's all about? Tomorrow morning. Better let me. Sounds like my kind of job. Well, what makes you say that? Oh, I've seen the elephant and heard the owl, brother. You haven't. Worked in the mines, remember? I'll leave in the morning, Jerry. Oh, now, wait a minute. Eve is right. Nick, what do you say? Well, I got other things to do. All right, then that settles it. Eve, when you get up there, talk to Colin Murdoch. He's been superintendent of the mine since it opened. He'll be able to give you a good picture of what's going on. Right. And Eve, remember, you'll be representing management, and management seems to be a walking target right now. You watch yourself. Yeah. like that, he, uh, he gets irritable, gets annoyed at little things. I don't want no trouble, mister. No trouble. 
trouble. Just a room, a drink, and something to eat. Make it cold, Norton. Shut up. Gentlemen won't mind buying a lady a drink. Beat it. Oh, let a girl make a rent, will you, Newton? Well, I can't see you. There's nothing prepared in the house. Oh, he lies in his pit. There's a whole leg of cold mutton lying in his cooler. I told you to set your mouth. I'll tell you. Now, Mr. Girl, put it down there, girl. It's the only decent drop in the house. Let's have the mutton. Thing a man can't call his house his own. Well, I'll buddy and I can fight my own battle. Sure you can. Another second I'd have that big slob laid out with the whiskey and glass oozing out of his ears. Well, now you heard what the man said. You wouldn't want to waste the last decent drop of whiskey in the house now, would you? Hey, yeah, you talk good sense. For your help. And yours. Are you planning to spend the night? Planning on it. We asked Newton for the key to number eight. It's the best room in the house. I know for a fact the sheets was changed only a week ago. He'd hardly been slept in since. You don't let him tell you there isn't any room. Now, you're not going to spend the night. Now, why can't he spend the night? I don't want any trouble in my place. You wait till himself hears about this. Ah, the back of me front to himself and you too. You don't want to spend a night in a place like this. I own it, and I wouldn't stay here if I had any choice in the matter. Look, the beds are hard. And the bugs, you know. Oh, terrible bugs. Big enough to throw a man out in the street and leave him there to be eaten at the leisure. Let's have a key. It's only nine miles down the road to Sonora. Oh, it's a grand town. A grand town. With a decent hotel. And girls. Ah, oh, they got the finest bits of fluff in the mother load country down there in Sonora. Number eight key. I'll eat in my room. You heard what I said to him. I tried to make him move on, didn't I? Well, didn't I? Surprise, surprise. What are you doing here? Well, I thought you might like a nightcap. I brought up the bottle. That's all? What's your name? Bridie. Bridie what? Bridie Henry, honey. Go ahead, help yourself. How old are you, Bridie? Oh, now, I didn't come up to give you a pedigree. Well, I suppose not. Eighteen? Nineteen? Why, aren't you going to drink with me? How much do you make off a bottle, Brady? Oh, you're a wise one. I make a dollar. Information. That's a dirty word around here. What are you, a company spy? Nope. That's what they think downstairs. Why? Well, you're a stranger. If I was to tell them you was asking for information, they'd have you dead as a mackerel before the night was out. Will you tell them? Or should I? They ain't paying me nothing. Who's himself? You can put your money away. I'm the sole support of my old father, and I can't afford to be killed. Well, 
What does uh, twenty dollars mean to you, Brady? The rent paid, food in the house, and no need to be doing this for at least a month. Who's himself? Oh, Duel. Duel. Can you pass the word to him that I'd like to see him? What for? Just get word to him. What is that all you want? That's all, Brady. You're a strange one. I suppose a gentleman like yourself can't be bothered with the likes of me. Well, you ain't so much. I hope O'Doul cuts your heart out. troubles you've had up here. Now, the work of a few vicious malcontents. You've been shut down for weeks. I know, Mr. Barkley. But I've been in constant communication with Mr. Hummel since he took over management of the company. We've been working on the problem. Have you tried talking to the men? Well, there's no talking to them. They're demanding the sky. New housing, elimination of the company store. Things that have nothing to do with reasonable requests. Is that why they went on strike? I told Mr. Hummel it wasn't the right time to cut wages. Is that why they went on strike? Because you cut wages? Why? This is a producing mine. There's ore in sight for another ten years. And then what? A dead hole in the ground with nothing in it? Mr. Barkley, every penny I have in the world is tied up in 5,000 shares of Barkley Sierra. Every penny. I deserve to get whatever profit I can. And what about the people who work for you in that mine? Don't expect me to show any feelings for the murderers who gave me this. Then what about your own interests? Your shares are losing value while that mine is shut down. I have complete confidence in the company management. In fact, I've given Mr. Hummel my proxy to vote my shares. He assures me the mine will be open in a week. How? The only way you'll open that mine is by using strike breakers. Is that what you're up to? Mr. Hummel feels it's the only way. He assures me the Chinese are a docile and industrious people who will work cheaply. You're bringing in Chinese. You do that and you'll pull the cork on more trouble than you or Mr. Hummel can handle. Good day, Mr. Murdoch. <laughs> looking for me. You need that thing? When a man's on the run, you know how it is. It's been a long time, Heath. Since we worked in the mines, what are you doing up here? Organizing. This 
strike. Mm hmm. Do you have a drink about the place? Sure. What's it all about, Dion? Huh? The strike? Well, take a look around. The curse of the Irish. Them that don't die of the drink perish of religious melancholia. Or starvation, or get shot to death, or a hundred other ways to squeeze the life out of a man. The sad people, the Irish. What are you doing in Lonesome? Looking for answers to the strike. What's your interest? I represent the Barclay family. Tom Barclay turned out to be my father. Did he now? Didn't you stop to think there might be some risk in coming here? The bosses aren't popular in Lonesome, you know. I'm no boss. No. Of course you're not. Just a drop, please. No man that worked in the mines could become a boss. It takes a fine gentleman who's never raised a callus to work men until they drop. Cheat them in the company stars and starve their women and children. Get out the soapbox, O'Doul. That isn't true. Have you gone blind? Can't you see what's around you? Oh, you've changed. The Heath I used to know would have been right out on the lines with us. And I would be out on the lines with you if you were going about it the right way. And we are going about it right. We're asking for decent wages, an end to company stores, safe working conditions. And how are you asking? With bombings and murder from ambush? Man, turn us the war we're in. You can't win that kind of war. Dion, listen to me. Get your people together. Form a committee to meet with the company management to discuss your differences in an orderly manner. No. Why? It's not the answer. Let me talk to your people. Let them decide if it's the right way. I'll do the deciding for them. Well. That was Grand Taste and Whiskey. I believe in you now. Are we still friends? Well, that's a fine question to ask a man. Of course we are. But I wouldn't be speaking for others in the camp. The Barclays aren't popular, you know. If I were you, I'd leave town in a quiet kind of a way. Within an hour or two, no later than that. for the sake of your soul when they finally catch you and swing you off. Shut up with your talk about swinging. There'll be a meeting of the organization tonight. Tell the boys we may have some business to do. Go on. and the tides of opportunity wait for no man. Ah, yes. What do you want to talk about? Barclay Sierra. 
I'm a very busy man, Brother Barclay. Maybe you better come around to the office later in the week. Now, Uncle Sam. Right now. 300 Mirage Silver. Well, what about 45 it? 45 and a quarter. I understand you're bringing in Chinese strike breakers. You heard that, did you? Yeah. My brother's in lonesome. He wired me about your plans. Now you know you can't get away with a thing like that, Uncle Sam. You bring in 500 Chinese laborers on Wednesday, and by Thursday, they're scattered all the way from Camp Lonesome to the Barbary Coast. It's not my doing. It's the decision of the board of directors. Oh, come now, Uncle Sam. You control that board, and we both know it. All right. The shareholders entrusted me with management of the property. To my mind, that means making profits. Making profits means getting the ore out of the mine at the least cost. And Chinese labor isn't one-third as dear as what we've been paying. Why, you slippery old thief. I almost believe you started that strike just so you could bring in cheap labor. If you see any loose Barclay Sierra stock, Brother Barclay, snap it up. It's a good investment for the future. Gently, Brother Barclay, gently. Uncle Sam, you just started yourself a little war. And before it's over, I'm going to collect that greasy old hide of yours and have it stuffed. 200 grand copper. Eight and a half. Don't make a sound or we'll both dead. Well, what's wrong? Get up and get dressed. They're coming for you. Who's coming? The Molly Maguire. Did we get them all? Molly Maguire, is it? Well, you never mind the question. Do you want to kill us both? Why? You and your modesty. How did you know about this? I heard them talking. They think it's a grand thing to hang a Barky. Why are you warning me? For the $20 that'll keep you out of the saloon for a month. If we get out of this, you'll never be in that saloon again, I'll tell you that. I mean it. For the sake of the comfort it would bring me, Mr. Barkley, would you kiss me once? daughter not to bring her low saloon friends under the roof of my house. Mr. Barclay, tell me, Father, what happened? The Mollies were after me. Your daughter helped me. Barclay, is it? Oh, if I had me legs, I'd be out of the boys hunting you down. Father, please Tell my daughter now. if she's anything to say to me to speak to you. What is this? My father won't speak to me. He uh, doesn't care for the way I put food in his belly and a roof over his head. I never asked for a charity. He'd rather I let him starve than me work in a saloon and him helpless as he is. Thank God her mother died before she brought this shame on us. Oh, and I wish you'd die. Favor me. Stay here where I keep my eyes on you. Get back there. You try that and I'll howl so loud every Molly and camp will be in here before you can say Jack Robinson. Now you sit down over there. Suppose you think I'm a hard man. I think you're a fool. Oh, if I had me legs, you'd sing a different tune, me pile. Do you wonder where my legs went? Down in the mine, that's where, when the rotten timber collapsed. I should have died down there, and I would have, if it hadn't been for the hate that kept me alive. Hate for the lion mouth of him that made the lion promises that brought us here and put my daughter in the saloon to earn the bitter bread to keep me alive? Ah, it keeps me alive to curse the dirty name of Tom Barkley and all that come after him. I don't know anything about Tom Barkley's promises. Oh, 
But we've got a long night ahead of us. I'll tell you the promises he made. And then you go back to your Barclays and tell them why we spit on their name here in Lonesome Camp. so late. Dickery. Time doesn't mean much when a man's in the mood to dicker. Dickering, huh? What do you got? Oh, I've got something. What have you got? I never touch it. Oh? Well, then. How about a petition signed on behalf of the minority shareholders and joining present management from conducting any further company business? Sit down, Uncle Samuel. Pending a full stockholders meeting. It'll be filed, uh, let's see. Oh. Tomorrow. Hmm. Well, it isn't much. Oh? Well, then why are you dickering? Because you can be a nuisance, Brother Barkley. A tarnation nuisance. So I'm making you an offer. $333,000 for your holdings in Barkley Sierra. That's the market price before the stock went down. Now, there's a handsome offer, if I say so myself. What if I say no? <laughs> then you'd be a tarnation fool. Besides, you've got no right to say no. That's a Barclay family holding. You'd better talk it over between you before you say anything. All things considered, Hummel has made us pretty fair offer. We could get out of Barclay Sierra without losing any skin. You mean we'll get all our money back? Yep. And if we don't accept? Well, then we're in for a rather expensive fight for control of the company. All right, Jared, what are our chances? Hummel now controls 60% of the outstanding shares. And then we're lost before we start? Not necessarily. We might be able to win over some of the proxies he now holds. Oh, it's selling get out. Mother? I wonder what he would say. I'll tell you what he'd say. Well, what are you doing back so soon? I didn't expect to be back so soon. I was chased out by men carrying ropes. They call themselves the Molly Maguires. Did you ever hear the Molly Maguires? Any of you? Those miners have reached the limit of their endurance. The Molly Maguire is one of their secret societies. A violent one. They have the strange notion that it's better to die fighting than wait like sheep. A very strange and unrealistic people. I don't think you'd like them. Funny thing is, they don't hate the company management nearly as much as they hate the Barclays. Get to the point, Heath. Well, now, I was going to tell you what he'd do. Go on. He'd say, sell out. He'd say, wipe your hands of the whole dirty mess. He'd say, take your money and run. What happened up there? You think those men up at Lonesome Camp are striking against Hummel's management? His wage cut? Working conditions in the mine? Oh, you are so wrong. They're striking against him. Heath, I think you'd better explain that. And you explain to me his promises that were never kept. Good housing. Safe working conditions. Decent wages, schools for the children, and a company store selling at cost. Security for the old and the injured. What did they get? Leaking roofs. Rotten timbering in the mines. Dirty children playing in the streets and begging pennies. And a company store that charges four prices for everything. Do you know what they eat up there? Potatoes. Potatoes three times a day, seven days a week, and praise the Lord when a miracle puts a bite of meat on their plates once in a blue moon. And as for the old and the crippled, oh, they've got it fine and easy. 
if they have a daughter who works in a saloon to keep the company roof over their heads and enough food from the company store to keep them alive? What he promised them was hope. And what they got was a kick in the teeth. That is why they hate him. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You're very young, and the young are very intolerant. You couldn't understand a man like your father. You couldn't understand how a man might make promises in good faith and then be unable to keep them. You only heard one side of the story. Don't pass judgment on a man you never knew until you hear both sides. I've always had faith in my husband, and I still do. But if he was at fault in this instance, then we all are at fault. Your father left us a heritage of wealth and power and land. And he also left us his obligation. Jared? Yes, Mother? Fight Sam Hummel with everything we've got. You hold a thousand shares. I want your proxy to vote them. Jared, is the situation that bad? Believe me, it's that bad. We've got to get that mine back in operation. Who else will go along with you? I've got Mayhew and Chase to throw in with me. Now, what do you say? But even with my thousand, you're still way short of control. George, I only know one way to begin. That's to start. Thank you. 
Is this what you wanted, Murdoch? I didn't want murder. You've got to believe me. I didn't want murder. You said the strike would end in three days. That the men couldn't hold out any longer. And every day it went on, he said it was sure to end the next day, and then the next, and then the day after. When the violence broke out, I said, look, Mr. Hummel, let's call a halt to this. Let's sit down with the men and negotiate a settlement. He said nobody had a given right to work in Barclay, Sierra. That if they didn't want to work, he'd find men that would. He said that in a way, the strike was a good thing. Because it meant he could call in cheap labor. Increase the profits. He said there might be a little trouble. But he didn't say people would be killed. What can I do? What's this? Your proxy signed over to Jared Barkley to vote your 5,000 shares as he pleases. You wanted to know what to do? Sign. You were up at Lonesome Camp. I was. Got a little present for you. Murdoch's proxy. <laughs> this does it, boy. This does it. Looking well, Patty. I never felt better. Oh, that breath you got on the head. What are you talking about? My head's the hardest thing I've got. <laughs> it was a terrible rap. I knew a man got one like it once. Oh, he was uh, up in a bow, cheerful as a lark for three days, but then on the fourth, he was dead as a mackerel. What are you saying, man? That you're going to die, me boy. You don't mean it. Yes. But only for a little while. Who ever heard of a man dying for a little while? You got a plan, O'Doul. What kind of a plan? Well, the cemetery is inside the company fence. You need a burial permit to get past the guards. Need I tell you that a dead man is required for getting such a permit? They say there's going to be a new management and a settlement to the strike. Do you believe it? It's a trick. We're in a war, Patty. A war between the likes of us and the landlords. A dirty landlord's trick. Oh, we're not just fighting the Barclays. We're fighting all the bosses and all the mine owners. Why start anything now when the trouble's almost over? I'm telling you, we need the violence. We need the men in the other camps to know there's such a thing as the Molly Maguires, ready to fight for them against the bosses. What are you going to do? Blow up the works. Oh. oh, that's a grand plan. Then are you with me? Oh, Patty, you'll be a famous man. How long do I have to stay dead? Only a day or two. Will I have a wake? A grand wake. It's the height of my career. I'll be attending my own wake. <laughs> Oh, oh, why did he die? He never ate meat on Friday. 
Not on any other day, the poor soul. He was pure in his thoughts about women. He never missed a sacrament. He never gave way to sins of lust. Why did he die? Oh, <laughs> why? <laughs> why did he die? <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Tolliver. I suppose you've come for the burying permit. Who are you burying? Padre Gohulahan. Himself that was called Paddy the Ghoul. Ah, the poor soul. Sure he never missed a wake if it was within a hundred miles. Yeah, it's a oh, oh! The shame of it all. A poor man dead. And not let to lie in peace in his own box. I guess it'll be all right. Only the pallbearers past the gate. Yes. Yes, Mr. Tolliver. Oh. <laughs> a toast! A toast to Paddy the Ghoul! <laughs> Dying is a terribly thirsty business. <laughs>
Oh, do! Oh, do! Oh, do! Oh, do! I want to talk to you. Strike's over. I should have killed you the first time I saw you. Thank you for it. Brady, good luck. 